from us moving on. Ooh. Hello, travelers, and welcome. We are so excited to have you here. And we, you are also so lucky because you have come to learn all about being a, an applied game master from this panel of amazing game masters. And so, we have come together to have this time and we are super excited. So, before you head out on your epic adventure though, we want to make sure that you have some basic definitions of what we're talking about. We as well, first of all, who here likes role playing games? Yeah, good. All right. Yay! Well, but we figured that we would just level the playing field just in case. And so, really quickly, panelists, he, pop quiz what is a tabletop role playing game? I can take this one if you want. Sure. Tabletop role playing game is typically a collaborative storytelling experience that takes place with anywhere between one and, heck, I've done it with up to a dozen players where one person usually leads the adventure and it mostly takes place inside the imagination. Some of the popular games are Dungeons and Dragons, Shadowrun, Starfinder, and a whole host of other ones. That's good. Um, <laughs> so I'll explain what a dungeon master or a game master is. When you are playing a role playing game, you get to play as the main characters. And the dungeon master or game master plays as everything else, including the weather, the people that you meet, the bad guys, the other good guys, the love interests, everything that you need to have an epic adventure that is not you is the game master. And but what's an applied game master? Because that's what we're here to talk about today. So when you're playing a normal tabletop role playing game, the goal is to have fun. You know, you're just having fun with your friends. There's no ulterior motive. An applied GM is someone who is looking at the game and thinking, how can I use this as a vessel to teach something or reach some sort of goal? That might be, let's teach someone how to speak Spanish. And so how I'm going to do that is have all the elves speak Spanish. Or a therapeutic group might be like working through social anxiety for a lot of social encounters, things like that. So today you have come to begin your own epic quest to become an applied game master, or maybe you're already starting along that path, and we're gonna talk to you a little bit about it and hopefully send you off on your epic quest. And first we have here, Joe. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Joe. Hey everybody, my name is Joe. I am a licensed chemical dependency counselor intern in the state of Texas. I have co-created something called the Supportive Gaming Community at Texas Christian University for the university's counseling center. And I host the Tabletop Theory YouTube show. A uh, little word about how that all kind of started. Um, I've been running RPGs for 30 years. I started when I was six, I'm 36. And throughout that whole time, the whole enjoyable process of it is what I'm sure all of you know. It's the idea that you get together with your friends, you have a good time, you get to tell a story. When I was going through grad school to learn how to become a counselor, I started to see commonalities between counseling theory, educational theory, and what makes a good game master to me. So, we got the opportunity at TCU to start a supportive gaming community, which is basically giving students who don't have connectedness on our campus an opportunity to get together and build community. But we didn't have a way to reach them. We didn't have a way to help them build their community. So that's what we did. We started with a couple of small groups teaching RPGs, and went from there. And then when COVID happened, they wanted to learn how to be a GM, so I started the YouTube channel because I couldn't do it in person, so that's me. Awesome. And <coughs> next we have Amelia. Hi everyone, I am Amelia Herbst. I am an individual counselor, so like psychotherapist, I see people in therapy. Um, and I'm also a therapeutic game master for Game to Grow. So how many of you have heard of Game to Grow? Oh, quite a few, awesome. Yeah, that's very good. Awesome. So Game to Grow is a 501c3 nonprofit based here in the Seattle area that is dedicated to the use of games of all kind in a therapeutic, educational, and community growth aspect. The cool thing about Game to Grow, for those of you that don't know, is we are currently running games of all kinds, primarily D&D or any kind of tabletop related and Minecraft online from kids to adults around the world. So if you have anyone that's interested, or if this is something that seems like it like really like sits at home for you, be it for yourself or someone that you know, or if it's just an organization you want to support, definitely check them out. Um, everything you can find is at gametogrow.org. 
Other than that, I'm the community manager of Geeks Like Us, which is an organization dedicated to combining passion with career. So I've got a fun day job and a fun night job, so geeks all around, I love it. Um, for me, I got into applied RPGs by using it in college counseling. For me, I noticed that a lot of college students struggle with social anxiety, and what a great way to be able to tap into practicing social anxiety skills by doing it through the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Awesome. And we have Peter. So I'm a social skills dungeon master for aspiring youth. I've been doing this for about seven years. I also run the blog rollforkindness.com where I talk a lot about the lessons I've learned over the seven years. I have made a lot of mistakes. So I do this so hopefully other people will be able to avoid those mistakes and kind of get some larger ideas about how they can be really, really intentional on the hitting those goals and leveraging the innate powers of role-playing games to meet goals, whether that's through narrative, through mechanics, whatever. Um, I also have developed uh, three nonviolent RPGs. The first one is a caravan sim. The second one is kind of a more therapeutically oriented one called Speaking with Monsters, where I am working with a therapist to create a way to personify a non-evil monster as someone's you know, OCD or something like that to facilitate co uh, conversation. And I'm also the curriculum author for the autism, social, emotional learning uh, game, Ava, where I developed a RPG as part of the curriculum. So that's through Social Cipher. And my day job is I work as a community mental health crisis worker, doing a lot of family, yeah, family stabilization. And I've been very, very fortunate enough to be able to use D&D and Minecraft in that vicinity. And the way I got into, um, Applied RPGs was kind of by accident. I was running these random gen uh, games at my friendly lo local gaming store. And the, um, I was working in foster care back then, and the owner told all his foster parent friends, hey, there's foster care groups at my game store. So suddenly, all these groups are full of foster kids and foster parents saying, hey, this is so great. I'm like, what's happening here? And then the, the owner's like, hey, good job running the, the, the foster care groups. I'm like, what? And so that is kind of where I got this aha moment, this can be really useful. So been doing this for, that was like nine years ago. And so uh, ever since then, it really clicked that RPGs can be applied, can do good in the world. So that's me. Wonderful. So you can see that our fifth panelist, um, no, it's not really there. People were looking, you're so great. Um, is not here because he works with immunocompromised children and decided that he would send us a video instead. So this is Alexander. Hello, PAX West. My name is Alexander Pereira. I am the patient technology specialist at Methodist Children's Hospital in San Antonio, Texas. And effectively, my job is that they pay me to hang out and play video games and be a general nerd with all the kids in the children's hospital. It is an awesome job. There is a panel on it later. Right now, we're here to talk about how we use tabletop RPG in the hospital setting. And so a little bit of background on me, I have a master's in education technology with a focus on games and education, and I kind of fell sideways into this job. Basically this field didn't exist or barely existed about seven years ago, and I kind of fell sideways into the very beginning of this field. I have been a, uh, a patient technology specialist for four years, which puts us right around one of the earliest programs that exists. And basically since day one, I have been stumping to use tabletop RPGs in the hospital setting and have had bosses who just, flank, frankly, do not understand what D&D &D is, um, but have been very kind in letting me be a nerd and letting me try it. Um, I have been playing tabletop RPGs for about 15 years, ever since my friends and I were like, you know what, we've heard enough nerds talk about this, let's go grab Path finder and learn how to play and I've been a DM the entire time. Um, I've only played recently as a player. But we, I took that, I fell in love with it. Um, I've always been a writer, I've always enjoyed that kind of stuff. And I've had the opportunity over my career, largely working in summer camps and, and after school programs and stuff like that, to use it with kids um, in a like, hey, we're just gonna have fun and play kind of way. Um, and have seen so many great results, you know, socialization of kids who have been whisper quiet the entire time, suddenly like taking charge of a table, 
uh, speaking up, showing up with their own dice, all kinds of amazing things like that. So I've always known it's amazing. Um, and when I got to the hospital, we have a lot of problems with our patients being socially isolated, um, as well as physically isolated, especially now in this age of COVID. But also, the hospital is a very traumatic time. You're never in the hospital for, well, you're almost never in the hospital for fun things. Um, and so, having kids come through, I've always thought it was something that'd be valuable, especially for patients who are there for very long-term stays. Um, we've had patients who have been months, you know, six months, nine months, 300 days. Things like that, just really long stays. And I've always known tabletop RPG has been useful, and I was lucky enough to get the chance to do it with a couple kids early in my career um, as a patient tech specialist. But I'm a DM who is used to long, winding games, and it took us almost four hours to play through a game. And as I got busier and busier and busier and busier, um, we've learned that that was not the most effective tool. So just recently, we partnered with game to grow to help bring in kind of that expertise on how to run a very tight 90 minute game. And we're providing the socialization, the um, escapism and all the fun of tabletop RPGs to our patient population and doing it in a very like manageable 90 minutes that I can actually carve out of a week and not feel too guilty about or just not have the time for. Um, and what's really cool about it is it's not about therapy, it's not about anything like that. It's about providing that release and that escape. Um, and our population, ideally, is only ever around for one game. So we have a lot of uh, very high turnover and patients who, in a, it's a good thing, but will not be around to play multiple sessions. So unlike your game at home, for us it's a good thing if we don't have a patient come back and play with us again. It's a better thing if we have a patient who really wants to stay and play, um, which we don't want them to. We want them to go home. But um, it's always a good sign that we've done something right when we have a patient who's excited about playing and sad to not be playing. Um, but that's a little bit about our program, a little bit about how we're using tabletop RPGs in the hospital setting. Um, and once again, I wish I could be with there with you guys, but Unfortunately, my work with immunocompromised children and just general hospital environment means it's probably the best if I am doing this virtually. And I'm Marianne Cullinan, and I'm a middle school teacher in Antrim, New Hampshire. Who here's heard of public school? Yeah, public school! Yeah, support your public schools. Their, their teachers are pretty tired right now. That's how I probably convinced my principal to take the third and fourth days off of school to be here. Um, I'm a PhD student at Lesley University studying role-playing games in middle school classrooms. I'm a general gamification enthusiast. I would say I came to this work sort of sideways as well. I had been doing things that I would have called simulations in my classroom for a really long time. And I went down to PAX Unplugged a few years ago and saw a panel called Hand Her a Sword, which was about girls and D&D. &D. And I was like, I could do that. I mean, because I'm a child of the 90s, right? And girls didn't really play D&D &D then. They could like date the nerds that played D&D, &D, maybe, if they knew they existed. Um, but. It, we, girls weren't like allowed to play in rural New Hampshire at that time. So I went around and I was like, you look like you are a girl and might want to play D&D. &D. And thankfully, Stranger Things was around and we started a group called the Slay Queens, which the girls made up, and which is ironic because they refuse to kill anything and want them all to be pets. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. Um, so, and then I also had kids who were really interested in Greek mythology. And so I started using what I learned about role-playing games to help my simulations in classrooms move forward. And um, we did a panel about that yesterday. Yes, there's my panelists over there. Um, and, but today we're just sort of talking about applied RPGs. We also have about 260 kids in our entire public middle school and 50 of them are after school in Heroes Hall, the D&D &D club. Yes, so slowly I am poisoning all of the minds of New Hampshire school children to be nerds like us. 
so we want to poison your mind as well, and we welcome you to the fellowship of the Applied GMs. Look at us. Look at how hero <laughs> heroic we look. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Um, that was sort of ironic. I didn't actually mean we look heroic. But um, we are here today to talk to you about some of the things we think you should know about being an applied game master, and then we're going to hand you the metaphorical sword, and you are gonna head off and tell us all about the amazing things that you are doing in your own communities. We are going to start with the fabulous king of tea himself, Joe, who's going to help you understand how do I create myself as an applied game master? I am really stoked that that's apparently an honorific that I have now, king of tea, that's pretty cool, but okay. So, what we thought we would do is take you all through the process of creating yourself as this applied game master that you all may be considering becoming. And I know for my players, whenever I go through the process of making characters with them, I like to ask them questions. So that's what we're going to do all together. So I'm going to start asking you a couple of questions. So who here has played a tabletop role-playing game like Dungeons and Dragons, Shadowrun, whatever, right? Okay. How many people here have run those games as game masters, dungeon masters? Okay, okay. All right, now here's the really important question. How many of you here feel like you have done something good for your players as a game master when you've been running those games? Yeah, okay. Some of you are like, okay, I'm not sure what you mean by good. What are you talking about, right? So good in this context can mean fun. It can mean something that you just had a good time, or it can be something a little bit deeper than that. It can be that you helped somebody maybe feel more comfortable in their own skin. Maybe you felt them uh, get more involved in a community that they might have become a part of because of playing a role-playing game. And the thing is, being an applied GM really comes down to the idea of wanting to help wanting to assist somebody in those outcomes. And so the really important question that you all get to answer is how do you want to use role-playing games to help people? Because that's really vital. Now right now, inside of the applied RPG space, a lot of people are using role-playing games to help people um, work on their own mental health. But the thing is, that's not the only thing that role-playing games are good for. I mean, yes, there are people up here on this panel that use role-playing games, I mean, myself included, to help people work on their mental health. But there's lots of other ways to do it. I mean, Marianne and Peter and lots of other people out there in the world are using role-playing games in really creative ways. And I'm willing to bet that some of you here are like, yes, that seems like a really fun thing that we could do. I really want to help people in whatever way that I want, be it with mental health or learning about history or social skills, to, to I want to do that. But I'm also willing to bet there's people in this room that have ideas for how to use role-playing games to help people that no one up here knows about, that nobody up here has thought of yet. And that's the really cool part about this. Because RPGs on their own do a really good job of helping to build certain skills. They do a really good job of helping to develop critical thinking. You know, if you're like trying to figure out how to defeat a monster that has a specific weakness, try to, you know, like figure out a trap or something like that. They help to teach social skills in certain settings. I mean, social interaction in Vampire the Masquerade is very different than Dungeons and Dragons is very different than Star Wars. So, and I see a couple of people like, yes, I would not want to interact with somebody in Star Wars the way I do when I play Vampire the Masquerade. It's a very different animal. So, so, all of those things come together, and the last one that's even just the most basic but most important to me anyway is the idea of empathy. Empathy is just appreciating something from another perspective. And that's what you do as a player and a game master whenever you sit down at the table. You're putting yourself in someone else's shoes. So, with all of those things just baked into RPGs in general, it's no wonder that there's a lot of ways that you can help people or want to help people with this particular kind of tool. So as you start to go through the process of figuring out what it is that you want to do, that's the important thing. Just like it's important as a game master to develop your own style, you're going to develop your own style if you try to move through this process and develop yourself as an applied game master because everybody does it differently. There's no two GMs that run any game the same way. And that's good, because it means there's a big diversity of thought and application that goes into this. And if we want to really try to help people and bring things like an improvement to someone's mental health or help people understand something like Greek mythology, we need as many ways to do it as we can. 
So one thing I wanted to ask the panel real quick is how did you know when you started moving over that line from being a game master into the applied game master space? For me, it was uh, when that one foster parent approached me and said, I've never seen that kid talk that much. And he's been bounced around a lot. He's usually like this. And I would have had no idea. The, the kid was pounding on the table, coming up to me afterwards and said, I've never been more scared in my life of that, that cult lord. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. And he's like, no, no, it was great. He was really creepy. And, and so <laughs> I, I was about to apologize to his dad for terrifying his kid. And he's like, no, thank you. And um, he just kind of told me a little bit of the, the youth story and how impressive it was that he had been you know, pounding on the table and just really getting into it. And that was the aha moment for me. I think for me in the therapy setting, it was when one of my clients kind of during the checkout process, when we were talking about what went well that day, he kind of looked at me and he's like, did you realize that I actually advocated for something that someone else in the group wanted and I wouldn't leave you alone about it. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. Because this was a guy that just wouldn't talk. He was typically the one that'd be like, okay, I think I want to do this if that's okay. And then I decided I was taking away someone's donkey and he was like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to pay for it. And I was like, Right on, and it wasn't until later when he was like, do you realize that I actually finally like, got up the courage to do that? And I was like, right on, man. I think what the most important thing, and probably many of you already do this, is you are playing in collaboration with your players. And when you have been playing with the same people for 10 years, it is kind of funny to screw with them and mess up their <laughs> OCs, right? It is, like, we're all friends here. But when you're an applied game master, we're a team with the players. Our, the whole idea is we're telling a good story together. And so it's going to be hard because you can't have a story that's like once upon a time some heroes did nothing. The end, right? That's a crappy story. That's like Tuesday afternoon at the office. And we're already those heroes. Um, so, but you know, there needs to be adventure. There needs to be challenge but you're there to help the people grow. I think when I really realized that uh, role-playing games were going to be important in my life is when I got in a big fight with the basketball coach because the entire girls' basketball team didn't come to practice because we were all leveling up. <laughs> and so they were uh, at Heroes Hall instead. So it is important and and really having that idea of us all being together on the same team is, is part of how we grow. And now we're gonna move on to the melodious bard, Peter, who is going to sing a song for you about how to pick up a quest. I'm going to do no such thing. I'm completely tone deaf. <laughs> um, so just uh, audience participation uh, and gonna actually mix up from the question I have here. Uh, who has a population or a space that they could see themselves doing an applied RPG in? Show of hands. All right. Who has a skill that they would like to teach through RPGs? Mm. All right. A bit less. Both are good. Um, I have done both. I have done like a marine science RPG, and I've done like foster care groups, I've done uh, girls' groups, etc. Both are fun and both are needed, so thank you. Um, so getting into the applied RPG community and world of that is you have to start by thinking about A, what the population is, what the skill is, and how can I teach that? So a good example of that was I was talking with a uh, English language learner group, um, or a teacher who taught at ELL Classroom, and he was setting up RPGs there. So we had a very long conversation about how he would do that, what that would look like, would it be more about building social confidence or the practical language skills? So you have to start by thinking about how would I do this group? What are the sort of barriers? What are the logistics? And that's really more the tricky part, is the logistical piece. And then starting to think about what are the actual needs? Because when you're going into a group like this, it is very easy to think that you have all the answers. And if you go in with that angle, you're going to be flat wrong. So 
you want to look at the group as it comes to you, and then always keep an open mind and see what arises through emergent gameplay. Because once the kids sit down at the table, it's going to be a very different space. Uh, you might see kids that are completely isolated, they don't really want to talk. Once they're in, in the, the, the gaming space, they're super talkative, and then they're hogging the spotlight. And then that creates a very different thing that you need to really navigate around. So being very, very cogent about what the needs are and being very explicit about what your goals are. Um, in fact, when I am designing or doing my session planning, I think about what each kid's goal for the session is. Will they hit that? Maybe, maybe not. But it really helps to be really cogent about what they're struggling with and how to help them getting there. So if it's a Spanish language group, you know that Bob is really struggling with verb conjugation. So you're gonna slip him a note with a bunch of verbs. Um, and then once you've kind of thought about the goals and the needs, uh, look at yourself. Figure out what am I good at? What do I need to improve at? And who can I lean on? Because this is a growing community. Um, there are a lot of people, uh, largely in the, the therapeutic world, but the skills they have are transferable. The knowledge they have is super helpful. And um, being able to identify what you're good at, what you can use, and then what, where you need help. So just being really cogent of that and then reaching out to the larger community. Finally, um, realize that you're gonna be a trailblazer. There have been some very, very big players in the applied RPG space, and all they have done is just show how big the field is. They have illuminated what they're doing, and then you can see, well, they're not touching this, they're not touching this, they're not touching this. So there is room for everyone. And that, I think, is the really critical thing. And if you're doing something really special, you're gonna find a ton of people who are so excited. Because one of the things I've been really, really impressed with the applied RPG community is the enthusiasm. So like when I started doing some theatrical D&D, everyone's like, that's amazing. Or I met a guy who was doing physical therapy D&D where there were push-ups to do dice rolls or something like that. It's kind of sadistic, but um, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it, it, it's to help him you know, build core, core muscles or whatever physical therapists do, I don't know. Um, but, but it was uh, actually really impressive and he created custom workouts for each class. So um, the amount of enthusiasm I've seen around that has been incredible. So no matter what you do, you will find a community, unless you're teaching kids stuff like how to start fires or something, don't do that. They can probably do that on their own. Uh, I Building teach middle school. Building a file is a valuable skill. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> we can right, talk later. that's fair enough. That might be a vampire the masquerade thing, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So I heard you say that you didn't want people to be overconfident in, and feel like they know everything earlier. But I also want to say, um, don't be underconfident. We need more hands up. Everybody yeah. in here can be an applied GM. Like, it's all kind of in the attitude, right? Like, I want to go out and make the world a better place, even if it's just my friend group or my own children. Or I want to be able to talk with my parents um, at Thanksgiving about not politics, right? <laughs> so, oh my gosh, Uncle Dan. Uh, so, right? The, so even if you're not gonna go and like change the entire world and fix mental health and the environment and also educate everyone in the next 45 minutes with your D&D &D campaign, you can make a difference with who you are and what you've got. So I, can I just get some more hands? Who here thinks they might be able to be an applied GM? Come on. Put them up. There yes, we go. that's why you're here. Nice. Well done. You Give can yourself do a hand. It. I'm, I'm we a need middle you. school teacher. <laughs> we from, need you. I'm a middle school teacher from rural New Hampshire, guys. There's 1,200 people in my entire town. If I can make D and D work and make it be something special in rural New Hampshire, you are going to be fine. There's going to be a lot more just people to try it out on, if nothing else. Uh, so we're going to turn. Think, uh, yeah. 
just very quickly, also remember for, we're typically, we're using tabletop RPGs, we're using Pathfinder, we're using D&D. For those of you that live in communities where anime is a big thing, or if you happen to work with kids that love like My Hero Academia, and if you're like, I'm never gonna get these kids into an RPG, why not create one based on the anime that they like? Absolutely. Why not be the all might to whatever little tabletop like role playing game you have for them and let them explore this passion that they have through that too. You're not pinpointed. You can do whatever you want. I did a Fortnite conversion. Just FYI. <laughs> it can be done. I it was ridiculous, but it kind of worked. <laughs> they, they, they loved it, so it worked. I'm a big fan of kids on bikes. That's very, that's a system that is very convertible that isn't necessarily that um, high fantasy setting, which can be really useful for populations that aren't interested in high fantasy. Um, and a lot of what I do is homebrew stuff because I have a curriculum that I have to teach in school. So I take some of the concepts of um, gaming and especially of role playing games and apply them to what I'm doing, but I'm not using D&D whole hog in the classroom because that wouldn't make sense. One more thing I wanted to point out is that for those of you that have run games as a game master before, your first session, I'm sure if it was anything like mine, you were nervous. It was the idea that, oh my God, I've got a bunch of people coming over to listen to me help them tell a story and I need to prepare what every single squirrel is going to look like. <laughs> there's, you feel like there's a lot of bases to cover. But the thing is, as you did it more and more, you got a little more used to it, you got a little more comfortable, and then you started to develop your own style. Same thing happens with applied RPGs. You have to give yourself the grace to be able to like, take a step back and say, okay, this is my first attempt. What am I gonna learn? How can I improve? And that's not a bad thing, because oftentimes the best growth comes from those types of realizations of, oh, I could do this better. Some people call those mistakes, and those are great. And one of the, the biggest thing, things I've heard from a lot of uh, newer applied DMs is that, oh, my group was absolute failure. They spent four sessions in the newbie forest. And I'll ask, well, were they hitting the group's goal? Well, yeah, but they, they didn't even get to the town. No, you were successful. But they, 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 did, they didn't get to the town. But they were hitting the goals. You were successful. Oh. <laughs> So just always realize that is, it is beyond the basic function of the game. You are there to facilitate the, them reaching that goal. I think that's a really good point. If all they wanna do is flirt with the NPCs and get pets for literally three months in a row, then let them, <laughs> because now they have lots of pretend pets and they're so happy. <laughs> um, so, we, so this all sounds all well and good, but how are we gonna sell this to the non-nerdy kids and parents and bosses and everything, right? That comes up over and over again. And so our fabulous invisible fifth panelist is going to tell us a little bit about that now. I'm back. So the question I wanna kind of pose to the panel as a whole, although I won't be able to hear them clearly, um, and talk about as well is how do you convince or sell tabletop not RPGs to non-nerdy kids and parents. So, like I mentioned earlier, my entire player population is drawn from the patient population of a children's hospital. That means on any given event day, I have no idea who my players are going to be. Um, we have longer term patients who might have played before and will be interested in playing again, as well as patients who kind of come back on a regular basis and have caught a game day and are interested in playing again. Um, but by and large, I am picking up a completely random set of patients every time we do this. Um, and even if I have five patients who have all done it before and are all interested in doing it, there is no guarantee, because these are patients in a children's hospital, that they're going to feel up for it that day. They might have had a really bad reaction to their medication. They might be in a procedure they might be asleep because they're just not feeling good. Um, things like that all come up. And so I am even even if I have five yeses, I am still going to be scrambling to find patients kind of as a guarantee. Um, on top of that, San Antonio is not a very nerdy city, which means very few of my patients have heard of tabletop RPGs, Dungeons and Dragons more specifically. Um, very few of them have seen Game of Thrones, which is good. They're children's hospital. Um, Stranger Things. 
pretty scary still. Uh, Lord of the Rings is out of the zeitgeist. Most people don't know, most kids haven't seen Lord of the Rings. Um, which means we struggle really hard to explain what this game is, and these games are, um, as well as sell them on the theming of the world. So we've developed, I've developed a strategy of, like, referencing the Marvel movies. So one of the things is we currently use the critical core system from game to go but we are looking to shift to kind of more of a superhero themed thing because I can hold up a barbarian and be like, this is the Hulk. And the kids are like, that's cool, I want to play that. Same with a rogue as Widow, you know. If I can reference Avengers, it's great, but it's really hard to explain a cleric and a druid to kids because there's no shapeshifters in the Avengers universe yet or the Marvel, uh, the MCU yet. Um, so we're maybe thinking of even shifting to a more topical, like, superhero-themed story set um, and tabletop RPG set. Um, but as a whole, this is a big question. Like, how do I get kids who haven't heard of it, aren't terribly interested in being a nerd, to try to play it and try to have that fun? Because most of them, once they've played it, will at least say they've had fun. They might not want to do it again, but most of them are like, that was a lot of fun, I'll do that again. Um... And that's our problem. Thankfully, we haven't had too many issues with non-nerdy parents freaking out about what it is. They're really excited to have patients um, doing something. There's a lot of interest in like, oh, okay, that sounds really weird, or maybe I heard of it. Um, but there's no real like hesitation from the parents. The only hesitation that ever comes up is they all have to send a bunch of forms about, hey, this is a video chat. They can see your face. They can see each other's faces, and that, of course, means we need the HIPAA compliance waived. Um, that's about our only hesitation. But I want to pose this kind of as a question to chew on for you guys, and then to the panel as a whole. Okay, so that was that must be quite a challenge. Um, he must be getting pretty good at selling <laughs> at the elevator pitch of RPGs. And so what about you, panel? What are you thinking about this? How do you sell tabletop role-playing games to everyone who doesn't already believe? So um, when we started the supportive gaming community back at TCU, um, it's a private Christian college. And I'm sure everybody in the room immediately assumes, oh, the satanic panic that happened back in the 80s must have been the first thing that everybody thought of. And you'd be right. <laughs> but the thing is, it wasn't what you ex would expect. It wasn't like, oh, you're bringing devil worship in. No, 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 no. It was just the idea that like, oh, wasn't that the thing that was controversial back in the day? And, and the thing that helped me the most to be able to sell it as a not necessarily a therapeutic modality, but as a way to build community, is research. There is a bunch of wonderful research that has been done from back in the 1970s through today. I mean, heck, I'm working on some right now myself that help to prove empirically the qualitative benefits of students who've gone through uh, role-playing game groups to bring up their GPAs. There's entire books that have been written about this. If you want like the book that kind of started this whole idea, go look up the book Shared Fantasy by Gary Allen Fine. That book pretty much started the whole idea of the applied RPG approach. He was a sociologist. Not gonna lie, it's probably older than many of you here in this audience. Also very true. 1983, yeah, 80s baby! <laughs> Yeah, it's wonderful. But at the same time, it's, it's worth knowing the resources that are out there to help you be able to approach this idea with people that might not be familiar with it. Because it, the Satanic Panic was big for Dungeons and Dragons, but if you say, hey, I want to run Star Wars groups for people, everybody's going to be like, oh, cool, I love Star Wars. Or, I mean, it's very rare you're going to find somebody say, what's Star Wars? But you're still going to have a reaction where people might not understand what a role-playing game is. So the, those little chunks of research are gold for trying to sell the ideas of what a therapeutic approach or an applied approach to role-playing games can be. So on the other side, I actually recently had to sell this to a parent who um, was very like taken aback, like, oh, that's, that's Satanism. And what I did was I actually looked at uh, her, her child and told a story that was relevant to her child's struggles. 
So being able to talk about one of my kids who was super, super quiet, and then once he was at the table, was like, all right, Sonny, this is gonna end badly for you unless you talk to the elf, or you'll be dealing with me. And just being able to say, you know, this was this wonderful tool that helped this youth find his voice. And she, as far as like, so there, there was no devil worship? No, just dwarves. No, no, no demon companies? Dwarves. Okay, cool. And so many pets. All <laughs> yeah, pets, a, all the pet, time. Pets and stereotypical Scottish dwarves. But um, by finding a story that matched that lived experience, you suddenly have an in. Um, so I found that is super, super helpful. And if you don't have stories, talk to people. They'll tell you stories. So in the adult world, it's kind of funny talking to someone who's like, I really like hiking, and I like to watch sports and all that stuff. I'm like, that's great. Would you be interested in doing a game like this? And then I explain it, and then it's like, nah, man, like, not my thing. I'm like, totally cool. I understand this isn't for everyone. So you really want to work on advocating for yourself. You have this huge meeting with a bunch of other players and your coach. You really were hoping to advocate for the other players that were having an issue with such and such thing. How about next meeting? you decide to get up or raise your hand in the middle of this meeting and advocate for the very thing that you're nervous about advocating for. And then I get this, so uh, so what's a barbarian then? And I'm like, do you think you wanna practice that? And he's like, oh, uh, yeah, I guess so. Because sometimes it's like, you know what, it might seem a little lame to be you know, a half orc slinging a hammer at people, but sometimes that's a little less scary and a little less lame than feeling like you can't advocate for yourself in the place where you really need to advocate. And I think what we know about role-playing games is that it allows you to practice skills in a much lower stake setting than you really would, right? I mean, that's, that's what it is because so many of us have either experienced or helped someone else experience. When, you have, when you're completely calm, you can usually tell everyone exactly what you're supposed to do in a time when you are not calm. It's just using that when you're elevated, right? And that's why a lot of times it doesn't work at school um, when I send kids down to the guidance counselor to like learn skills because they need to be able to use the skills quickly when their lizard brain is going off. And this allows them to have that feeling of uns unsafeness in a safe setting. And then if you accidentally murder the entire town and burn it down, looking for pets, then um, there nobody really died. So that's cool. And you can try again, right? And I think that's important. Um, and I would say that the way that we sell it at our school is uh, word of mouth. Once you get the first few people who are on board, they're going to sell it to their friends. And you're never really sure who's going to show up next. Did you want to say anything else about that, anybody? OK. We've got about 17 minutes left of the panel. Just a little time check for everybody. Um, so now, speaking of Game of Thrones, we are going to learn how to explore the dungeon with our fabulous queen herself, Amelia. All right, so I've got a lot of knowledge and I'm going to run through a lot of stuff. So if I say anything that doesn't make any sense or if I say, like, use a fun terminology thing that you don't get, um, I'm going to steal this from the Atoms of Game to Grow. If you want to like hold up a T really big, I will try to backpedal and slow down. <laughs> so just want to make sure I don't get anyone lost. Number one, kind of what we've been talking about earlier is the fact that trust that you know your stuff. One of the things that actually holds people back for advocating for the groups or advocating for running a game is the fact that they don't trust the fact that they know this. Even if you don't necessarily know all of the rules of Dungeons and Dragons, but you've played a few games, or you feel like this is something that, you know, your little siblings or little cousins might like, something as small as that to something as big as pitching it to a boss, a lot of people stop before they do that because they think that they're not going to be good enough for it, or they feel like they're not going to be prepared enough for it. Trust that you know it. A lot of you probably wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't feel some kind of interest or know enough to feel like you can pursue this. Number two, alter the language so it fits your setting. Let me tell you, if you go up to a boss and if they're not familiar with this and if they believe it's satanic panic, you're gonna have somebody going, ah. 
I mean, I kind of get what you mean with, you know, this basements and badgers thing, but I don't know whether or not it's actually going to stick here. So instead, in a, like in a setting where I come from, you know what? We have all of these groups. We have individual therapy, and we teach people skills. And then we kind of expect them to go out into the world with these skills, and they're still so anxious because they don't know whether or not they're doing it right. How about if we set up a group in which they can practice these skills, where they're safe, where they can fail or screw up, and then they're getting the feedback that they need to feel supported to try again? Let me tell you, both college counseling centers I pitched that to were like, right on, cool, just tell us what it looks like. Next is show the research and data. Joe did an excellent job of talking about that. There are some groups that are like, you know what, I hear you, I feel like this is something that would be really good, but who says it's gonna work? Who says it's not gonna cause problems? Who says that like it's not gonna turn a bunch of children into Satan-worshipping creatures? <laughs> like, because we have the research and the data behind it. So before I continue on, has anyone ever tried to pitch like a game? Be honestly, I'm even gonna ask video games. Ah, I already see a hand, and then you hit a bureaucratic wall. There was a boss that was like, no thanks, a community center that went, you know, demons and just kind of like stopped you in your tracks. Has anyone tried? I see a few people. It happens, but that doesn't mean that you, that you should stop moving. And one of the things that I encourage people to do is to tap into the resources or that, and the people that have done these. You've got a whole panel full of people up here. And if we can't help you, we know people that can help you. Because a lot of us hit these walls, or a lot of us know people that have worked in a setting or have run groups that are similar to what you want to do. One of the best things about this community is the fact that we want to continue to watch them succeed. So we are going to help you succeed too. Number five, show your enthusiasm. Really start to be like, this can work, I know it can. I know so-and-so that's done it, such and such research has talked about it. I have had this experience with it. This is going to be great for us because your enthusiasm is going to carry a message probably a lot farther than just being like, okay, well, here's the data. I kind of know what I'm talking about, but I mean, it's not that big of a deal if you don't want to run it, you know? Get a little more excited about it. Number six, I kind of mentioned, remember that sometimes we're gonna be met with failure. We are. I remember the first time I tried to pitch this group at a community mental health center, and they're like, great, I think the kids will like it, but we don't have the funding for it. We're not gonna be able to bill insurance. And that sucked. <laughs> and a lot of you that have probably tried to bring it up and have tried to pitch it and have gotten the, uh, Insurance, eh, this, eh, that. There's always going to be another opportunity if you seek it out. Any of the panelists have any stories or anything? We have about 12 minutes, so I want to have everyone sort of think succinctly about this question, <laughs> if possible. Sure, I'll go real quick. Um, I think the aspect of showing enthusiasm cannot be overstated enough. We're all here in a room in Seattle because we all love stuff like this. And it's important to bring that excitement and that enthusiasm with you. Because just like you were talking about, that barrier that you achieve and they're like, nope, sorry, can't happen. There's clearly an appetite for this. There's clearly a desire for this type of work. There wouldn't be this many people in this room if people didn't want to use role-playing games to help each other. So just because something stops you from going in one particular direction, it doesn't mean that that's the end of the road for using this particular method to help people achieve whatever goals that you're looking for. And on that note, there is such a need. There is no shortage of kids that need help right now and I work in mental health crisis, please, please, uh, if it can give them something to look forward to, uh, you know, even if it's just one night a week, plan some RPGs, please. There is no shortage. We need you. So we're going to see now you're going to get to learn from the mystical stag of the forest. 
Um, we are going to end with, so what's the treasure, right? What's the point? You've sat through 50 minutes of us jabbering at you. And so we thought that it might be interesting to end with a few stories uh, about things. The treasure is the friends we made along the way, guys. It is. But it, I know, it kind of makes me throw up in my mouth a little, but it's true. <laughs> and so I want to tell you two quick stories um, one serious and one silly, and you'll have to decide which one is which. Um, so I have a student who has um, some pretty severe uh, challenges with expressive language. He's super smart. He can hardly talk. It takes forever for him to say anything because of his processing speed. And so his first character was uh, basically a burn down the town character, right? Everything someone would do, like the, man, the NPC would come and be like, you should speak to the land creatures. And he'd be like, boom. And, and then the man would be like, why did you slap me? And then he'd kill him. <laughs> and then we'd never know why you had to talk to the land creatures. And that became incredibly frustrating. And so after about six months, he's like, I don't think I want to play that character anymore. I need a character who talks to people. And I'm like, yes, you do. Ha -ha. Um, the other story I want to tell is about, uh, we use role-playing games, homebrew role-playing games in the classroom. One of them is um, about Greek mythology, and the students make up their own islands on a biome, because they have to learn about biomes, and then they have to learn about specific myths and sort of triangulate all that together, and they end up creating items that drop for loot. And one of them is called Baby Hephaestus. Baby Hephaestus is, Hephaestus is a Greek god. You cannot give Baby Hephaestus away. You cannot kill Baby Hephaestus. You can't do anything, with, it's a baby, and it's a god, and it's incredibly heavy, and it makes you always last in initiative order because you're encumbered by this child. And so they were on this island and this group ended up with four of them. <laughs> and so then they finally got off the island and they um, went uh, up against the chimera, at which burned all of their possessions, including the babies. And they were like weeping and hugging each other and being like, the baby is dead, the babies are dead. And my principal came in to do my yearly observation. <laughs> so if I can survive that, you, my friend, can survive anything, or at least you can talk to me on Twitter and I will commiserate with you. <laughs> what else do we have? How, what are some serious and silly stories about why this is worth doing? So my one is silly and serious. So I had one student in my social skills group um, who was with the group for four years. And when she started, she was super quiet, super withdrawn. And as the group progressed, she became more and more outspoken, uh, eventually playing this half-orc barbarian who was covered in spikes and super loud and angry and very, very cool. Um, and she started running guest DM sessions. So when uh, Dr. Rafael Bocamasso, my co-facilitator at the time, went on to run Take This, um, I was like, Will, I need someone to help me run this group. And so I actually hired her on. She is the first second generation applied social skills DM. The problem is that she is now incredibly confident. So I will go on vacation. And when I come back, she'll just explain, OK, so the mind flayers are now on our side. The god of chemistry is dead. And by the way, uh, the party was all killed. And they're now clones now. Like, mind flayers. Yes, the mind flayers are on our side. This was supposed to be about elves, but the mind flayers are on our side, and the god of chemistry is dead. Go. It's great. It's great. I absolutely love it. I miss the god of chemistry. <laughs> um, so, okay, what I mentioned, we, uh, what I do at the university is. I've created these uh, groups with some other facilitators to help students uh, find their own community and to help deal with loneliness, disconnectedness, things like that. When the group started, uh, we put up one flyer and it was full, the full six-party, six-member party for two facilitators in less than a day. 
So, of course, people want to play D&D, right? So we go through the entire semester. This is in the fall of 2019. Spring of 2020 happens. This is going really well. Let's start a second group. So we start a second group uh, for myself. Now we have three groups all completely full. Back in the fall, the students didn't know each other. None of them had met each other prior to starting these groups. Give it about four sessions. We meet once a week. And then each session, they hang out after the game is over. We've been playing for like two and a half, three hours. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, and they hang out for 10 minutes, next session, 15 minutes, next session, 40 minutes, session after that, several hours, longer than you play the game. Then we want to start a Discord because they want to communicate outside of that type of face-to-face uh, -face environment. Fall of 2020 happens, the beginning of that second group, same repeatable after-game ratio starts where they want to hang out with each other. Then coronavirus lockdown happened, and we started meeting online, and it kept escalating the same way. They want to stay connected. And it's been this amazing journey with these students where some of them have started their freshman year and we're starting our third year. It's the same players in the same universe. Both groups have been running for more than two years in the same universe, which helps to create uh, this sort of joined experience. And it grows the community organically from there. And that's been amazing to see because you have so many people that don't know each other but have these common interests and they want to meet more people that have the same loves and enthusiasms and interests that they do. And even though we're not doing capital T therapy, these communities are still helping these students to meet people and not have to feel so lonely. It's a wonderful thing that we've been able to do and I'm really, really happy that it worked as well as it does. Um, for me, so clearly do it in therapy. Um, one of my clients was so anxious and loved musical theater. One of the things that he wanted to do was to be able to perform. But when he would do things like he would sit at a table for his college fencing club, he would get so nervous that the rubber band trick that I taught him to try to like calm his nerves, his wrist would be red when I'd see him. Through the use of this group, one of our co-facilitators decided that she was gonna it was supposed to be like, kind of like a godlike bard, but she kind of turned into a crime boss, which was fine. Um, so she had his dear Elizabeth. She was like, well, my performer didn't show up today. What are you going to do about it? And he was like, I'll do it. So he wrote a poem down, not just stood up, one foot on the chair, the other foot on the table. I had to move like the game mat out of the way, like, OK. Uh, and he did, read this whole poem. First, his voice was shaky, and then it started to come out. And he's like, and this is why I tell you I need my dear Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a mule. <laughs> <laughs> and just the, everyone at the table was shocked, and just the applause afterwards. And I heard he actually started a YouTube video where he was finally singing some of the songs from Dear Evan Hansen, and he's posted it for the first time. We could literally talk about this for probably the rest of the conference, if not the rest of all of our natural lives. And I know that many of you have stories like this too, because we could see you nodding. And if you don't have stories like this yet, you're going to, because you are going to join us on our quest. That's you with the purple head, in case you weren't <laughs> sure. And you, someday you are going to the pe be the people up here at PAX giving this panel. And we're super excited about it. And we want you to keep thinking about how you're going to do good in your community. The, so we have left you with a magical scroll. And if you use that, you're, you can use this QR code, decipher this magical code, and it will give you some of the talking points and things to think about as you start your own sessions. These are how you get in touch with us, and we, we really are stronger together as a league of applied DMs than we are apart. We want to hear all about the time that your children burn baby Hephaestus, <laughs> or, or become beautiful poets, or kill mine, or kill all your mind flayers, or whatever. <laughs> um, so please, uh, don't be strangers. Let us know what you're doing, and we're super excited to have you on the journey with us. Thank you very much. Yeah.